Thank you so much, Linda, and thanks, Scott, for uh, advancing the slides for us today. Um, I also want to thank the OPEG steering committee for having uh, the PCMS, uh, PMCS teams uh, out to talk uh, at OPEG this week. Um, my name is Shannon McKenzie, and I was the PI of the Enceldus um, PMCS. And as part of that um, study, uh, a team of scientists and engineers first looked at four different mission concepts and then decided uh, on which of those represented the best option um, and then did a point design study on that. And so that is the Enceldus Orbilander, which I'll be focusing on today. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, it was, this has been the effort of a, um, a great team. It's been a real honor to work with uh, the science team and the engineering team at APL. Uh, so just want to briefly acknowledge all of their contributions. Next slide, please. So I hope I don't need to spend much time motiva motivating why we want to go back to Enceladus. Enceladus's subsurface ocean is the best characterized subsurface ocean um, in the solar system, second only to uh, our, our very own Earth. And we know thanks to Cassini's fly-throughs of the Enceladus plume, that the subsurface ocean seems to meet the criteria for habitability. There are the chemical ingredients, liquid water, and energy sources that we uh, think are necessary to sustain life. So with those three boxes ticked, uh, that leaves one remaining question. Next slide, please. Is Enceladus inhabited? Next slide, please. So going into the next decade, uh, we wanted to provide the Decadal Survey um, a quantified understanding of the science return of a Enceladus life detection flagship class architecture. Um, perhaps most of you are aware that there have been uh, discovery and new frontiers options proposed to return to Enceladus specifically to do life detection. Um, but as uh, up until our study, there hadn't been a, decade, um, a dedicated study of flagship class missions to do the search for life. So really the point of the study was to kind of um, fill out the phase space of possibilities so that we go into the decadal survey um, fully aware of, of what could be done. Next slide, please. So after looking at a couple of different options, like I mentioned, we thought that the best science return per dollar was represented by this concept of the Orbilander. On this slide, I'm showing a general mission overview, including our timeline. Project start would begin in 2031 with a launch in 20, the end of 2038 or 2039 as the backup. Importantly, we have three distinct suites um, of our payload, the life detection suite, we have a reconnaissance and remote sensing suite, and an in situ science suite. This is just one spacecraft that both orbits, that's the orby part, and then the whole thing gets down to the surface uh, for, land, uh, for landed operations, that's the lander part. We're powered by two RTGs and a battery, uh, and we come in at a cost of $2.56 billion in fiscal year $25. Next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned a couple times that this is a um, search for life mission. From the very beginning, we started with the assumption that our primary science goal, so when, when we had to make any kind of difficult decisions, uh, we would prioritize the search for life science goals and objectives. So here at the top of the pyramid, I've listed our five science objectives that meet that search for life goal. And we've broken our biosignatures into two groups, chemical biosignatures and our confirmation biosignatures. These, uh, the confirmation is really um, higher risk, but higher reward uh, biosignatures relative to the chemical biosignatures that we know that we can get based on Cassini data, or we're more confident that we can get based on Cassini data and have high TRL instrumentation. Below that, you'll see our two secondary objectives. Uh, and they are secondary, uh, but very critical to that search for life interpretation um, 
providing really key context, uh, and we'll talk more about that. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. These goals and objectives translate into this science payload. Um, the, I won't talk much about the remote sensing and recon or in situ suites much more than um, just showing them here on the slide for you. Uh, but the life detection suite um, at the top, I've listed from left to right um, the instruments kind of in, in TR, decreasing TRL as you go from the left to the right. So uh, the mass spectrometers are, are um, high TRL examples or very similar instruments have been flown on um, or are getting ready to fly on coming, upcoming missions. Uh, same thing with the ion selective electrodes like on Phoenix. Then the microcapillary electrophoresis and microscope instruments uh, are at uh, approaching TRL6 thanks to um, funding streams like Matisse and Picasso. Um, but the nanopore is a TRL um, very low. <laughs> um, we still included the nanopore because we thought the search for a polyelectrolyte in, uh, enabled some um, just powerful science. But I want to make particular note that even if the nanopore did not proceed at the pace of development that we anticipate um, for a project launch in 2038, uh, this mission would still be, we, we think this mission would still be compelling to fly uh, without the nanopore should, should something arise with the um, development. Um, so I think it was stated yesterday that like, for example, an ice giants mission is ready to fly. Um, one of the findings of our study is that we think that a life detection mission to Enceladus is also um, uh, largely ready to fly. Uh, next slide, please. You'll notice that um, the instrumentation for the life detection suite shares some, um, shares some capabilities. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the ladder of life detection from Mark Naveau's 2018 paper. And on the right-hand side are our different life detection suite instruments. We purposefully selected the instrumentation to um, both include multiple ways at getting at different biosignatures and getting at orthogonal characteristics of life, because this is a flagship mission and we want to have a really robust uh, answer to that search for life. Next slide, please. We also took that complementary and orthogonal approach in the uh, reconnaissance and remote sensing um, objectives. So for example, we have both a radar sounder and seismometer for doing remote sensing and in situ interrogations of the ice crust. Next slide, please. So the Enceladus plume offers a couple different way, uh, reservoirs, if you will, of sample, sampleable material. Uh, advance, please. Uh, at the top of the plume is uh, mixed. We have uh, a dis uh, higher density of the vapor because um, it's all mixed together, but we have really small particle sizes. And if you go further into the plume, next, please. The, uh, we, the jets are more collimated, so it's, uh, the vapor is more collimated, but you get larger particles. Next, please. Sitting on the surface, you have access to even larger particles whose mass prevents them from getting launched higher into the plume. And next, please. Then once you're sitting on the surface, you also have access to uh, deposits that have um, been sitting on the surface for a while. So you can access a larger volume, but they might have been modified. Next, please. So for the Orbilander concept, we included uh, two ways of getting at um, the samples in these different reservoirs. Um, we classified them as either passive or active. So in the, uh, in the top, I'm showing Orbilander in its um, ramming direction where the where we have a passive collector, a funnel, a meter square in capturing area that captures plume particles um, at relatively low velocity since our orbital velocity is up to 200 meters per second. The little box is supposed to represent a gas inlet for the high resolution mass spectrometer. Then once we're down on the surface, that same funnel can be used to just sit and collect particles as uh, they fall back down to the surface. 
But we also include an active sampling mechanism. And for the purposes of this study um, and the scope that we were working on, we just uh, assumed that would be a scoop, something similar to what the Europa Lander study um, has been using. Although if this were to go any further, we would want to take a more careful look at what active mechanism is most appropriate for Enceladus, since Enceladus is uh, quite distinct from Europa. Next, please. We then had to make an estimate of, you know, how much sample are we going to need from these different reservoirs in order to detect those signs of life. And we did this in a similar manner to um, the strategy of the Europa Lander SDT, uh, making assumptions based on our knowledge of the biomass in Earth's oceans, for example, and uh, constraints that we know from Enceladus. So if you want to know more details about that, unfortunately, I don't have uh, much time to go into them here, but check them out in the report. Next, please. In the orbital phase, we are in an orbit with a 12-hour period. Um, most of the time, we are uh, coming back out, uh, approaching apoapsis, and we do communications back to Earth. Um, the orbits are unstable, so we have to do station-keeping maneuvers. But once we're uh, approaching periapsis, say at less than 100 kilometers, we do our primary science. Uh, oscillating our periaps between 20 and 70 kilometers, so we're able to get at both the mixed plume and the collimated plume. Next, please. The uh, concept of operations is really driven by our ability to accumulate enough sample to run our light detection suite. Uh, notably, we do not run the nanopore in the orbital phase because it requires um, an order of magnitude more sample than all of the other um, life detection suite measurements combined. Um, so as we are, every time we fly through the plume, we build up um, an amount of sample. And once we have enough to run um, a given subset, we take some time off from doing remote sensing and uh, dedicate a couple orbits to doing the life detection suite. So um, we have planned out the first 200 days and uh, have convinced ourselves that we would, uh, based on our assumptions of the biomass and a plume, have enough uh, sample to run one life detection suite run, as well as conduct 14 radar soundings and characterize uh, 42 landing sites and do 46 vapor analyses. So this kind of meets our threshold if you, of science, if you will. And if you advance uh, one slide, please. That leaves us with 2.5 times schedule margin because this is only after the first 200 days and we have um, 1.5 years in our notional schedule to be in orbit. So that means that if there isn't as much biomass in the plume as we anticipated and we need longer to build up enough sample, we have some time to accommodate that. Let's say that we're really unlucky and we're not finding the right landing sites. Then we have some time to accommodate um, a longer search period. If you advance one slide, please. We then get ourselves down to the surface after we've selected a suitable landing site. And um, again, our landed operations are driven by our timeline for accumulating sample. It happens uh, a lot faster on the surface because the accumulation rates um, just sitting on the surface from plume fallout are, are faster than plume fly through. And of course, just doing a, a scoop gets you a lot more sample a lot quicker. However, we've uh, tried to keep the cadence very relaxed to allow us um, time to respond to any kind of um, uh, you know, discoveries or, or to take our time flushing out the light detection suite, for example. And if you advance one slide, please. Three more minutes, yeah. Shannon. Thank you. We've built in um, schedule margin for the landed phase as well. Um, since we have scheduled two years on the surface, but we think that we can get um, three sets of the passive and active sampling, um, uh, three, set, three runs with the light detection suite with passive and active samples each um, in this uh, first 152 days. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so in, to summarize, uh, we have our orbital phase and our landed phase. Uh, where we're doing light detection both from orbit and on the surface, as well as our remote sensing investigations. Um, and we have one terabit of data return capacity, 
Next slide. And the I, question I often get is, you know, why are you bothering to go down to the surface? And um, this is a somewhat complicated chart, but I think it really underscores why our team favored this Orbi lander approach. So on the top here, I'm showing uh, the number of microbial cells per milliliter of ocean water. That really drives how much um, sample you need to collect in order to run a, any life detection um, analysis. We had to make an assumption, um, and we chose that 10 to the 3, if you advance one, please. Uh, for our study, but really there's a several orders of magnitude of uncertainty, which are highlighted in the green bar below um, that both arise from our uncertainty and how much biomass Enceladus's environment can support as well as uh, what kind of energy, um, you know, a, a, an ecosystem might require. So um, if you advance one slide, please. Based on our instrumentation, we know the uh, we know how much material each instrument requires. So that's this white bar down here. And if you, had, if you had a different payload than what we selected, your white bar would shift to the left or to the right. Advance one, please. The red here shows that, you know, some amounts of sample are just impossible to uh, process in the time scale of a um, mission. You know, we're not gonna process 3000 liters of material. Advance one, please. And then here we're showing uh, how much sample we think that we acquire with our orbiter and the landed phase uh, of Orbilander. Advance one, please. For context, Europa Lander assumed 10 to the two cells per mil. And if you uh, fly through Enceladus's plumes in Saturn orbit, you acquire um, a couple orders of magnitude less sample. Next, please. So the blue here is showing why we care so much about the amount of sample. Um, by having the context and a, an abundance of sample to access, we're able to collapse some of that uncertainty by, uh, by uh, constraining how much biomass the Enceladus environment might, um, might support. So if you advance one more, please. Uh, if we, for example, if we're in orbit and we uh, were unlucky enough to not detect a biosignature, um, we can start to collapse the uncertainty if that's just because we didn't fly through the plume enough times uh, once we're down on the surface and have access to even more sample. Advance one, please. So uh, our takeaways are that we think that there are compelling search for life investigations uh, at Enceladus and they are feasible to conduct in the next decade. Uh, this is largely in thanks to the opportunity offered by Enceladus's plumes, uh, which allow us to get at oceanic material with large volumes. This Orbilander is a flagship mission concept uh, with a flagship um, scope of science addressing astrobiology, geophysics, and geochemistry questions. And uh, finally, we'd like to advocate for continued support of uh, various technologies um, in related to um, sample collection and biosignatures uh, in order to facilitate the success of uh, astrobiological missions like this in the next decade. Thank you.